Okay, I'm Linda Lockard, and I'm the author of this book. And this book is a compilation of real diaries from the trail in 1846, as well as the entries taken from my journal of the reenactment in 1996. The names and locations may have been changed. However, what was not changed was the true grit that it took for these settlers to travel and open up the West, specifically the Oregon Territory. So how did they get there? And how did I get here? Mm -hmm. Wagons, we're going to start with them because that's the basic thing. Wagons are between 36 and 48 inches wide and 8 feet to 12 feet long. Now a pickup bed on a regular size pickup is about 56 inches wide, which is less than 6 feet and 8 feet long. So can you imagine putting your family in the back for six months? Everything you need, food, shelter, tents, whatever you have. And then on top of that, you're going to have 10 kids because the average size families on the wagon, wagon train were very large. And traveling over a six month period, they, if they weren't pregnant when they left, they were pregnant when they got to the other end, if they made it. So it was quite the thing. So I'm going to share a timeline with you and see if if I don't just throw you into a tailspin here, but 1843 was the Oregon Trail. They left Missouri, the east, and they traveled west. They didn't know what they were going to find, but they had all kinds of perils happen to them. And so by the time they reached Oregon, the Applegate brothers, there were three of them, Charles, Lindsay, and the other one I can't remember. They had sons with them. They had families with them. And what happened to the Applegate brothers was the same day they both lost their 10-year-old sons in the river. When people lost family along the way, they had to keep going. If they were in the river, they had to leave them. If they were dead on the trail, they had to bury them with rocks or whatever they could to keep them from being exposed to the animals and the Indians and the desecration. But in other words, they kept going. So when they got to Eden is what they called it, which is up in the Willamette Valley. By that time, they'd lost several members of their family. And I'm gonna go back for just one second and say, please excuse me, I have Parkinson's, so if I'm a little bit stuttery or I forget something, that's what's going on. Okay. So after losing their sons and having to leave them there, the Applegate brothers made a promise to each other that they were gonna get up into the northern part of the state and they were going to locate their families, and then they were going to go back. They're going to backtrack as soon as they had their families settled, which took them about three years. Mm -hmm. So that leads us to 1846. They're ready to go back now. They're going to go backtrack from where they were in Oregon all the way to Missouri and see what they could do. They thought that they were going to find a trail that was less perilous. They didn't. They found Jenny Creek Slide. They found uh, the Umpqua Canyon, which was called the dreaded Umpqua Canyon. When they're raising and lowering wagons over the mountains with ropes tied around trees and mm -hmm. men on the end of the ropes holding them so they were going down. I will tell you, at the Jenny Creek slide in 1996, they did lower the wagons, a couple of them. The Umpqua Canyon, we did not lower them with ropes. We did take different routes. So the route. If you found the route in 1846 and you went back and you thought you were going to get a better route in 1843, then along comes somebody else in 1847, which is my book is written for 1847, and we find a different route. Because if a wagon veers off the road 10 or 12 or 50 or 60 feet, maybe the other wagons can't find the, where the wagon tracks were. So they have to start a whole new route again. The Applegate brothers had no idea what they were going to run into with the Applegate Trail. However, they did not go back on the Applegate Trail. Levi Scott led them backwards. So when we took the trip in 1996, we did it from Winnemucca, Nevada to Independence, Oregon. So I'm going to jump forward again, 1993. I was at that point, my tenure with the City of Grants Pass, I was the Visitors and Convention Bureau Director of Tourism. And so I got very involved in the 1993 sesquicentennial, which is a 150-year celebration. And um, 
I wanted to be involved. So they took me out when the 1993 tra uh, wagon train was coming into town and somebody comes into my office and said, Linda, you need to be out there. You need to see them when they come into town because I had all these activities planned. Well, I didn't know they were gonna put me on a wagon, but they did. And I've never smiled so much in my entire life. As I, we're going down the road and you could hear the horses. Clip, clop, clip, clop, clip, clop. You smell everything and everybody was quiet. Cars were stopping on the sides of the road watching and we were going to the fairgrounds. We got there, there was masses of people there. And it was so much fun. But it was also pretty scary because we knew we had live animals on the road. What am I going to do for 1996 and get these horses across country without somebody running over them or the horses running over them? Things did happen along the trail. I was telling Andrew and Daniel earlier that we did have accidents. We had people get hurt. We had horses get hurt. We had wagons get destroyed. And we had brakes. We lost brakes. We did all kinds of stuff. But that was the way it was back in 1843 and 1846. There was no dress rehearsal. We at least got a dress rehearsal. We kind of had the idea. So in 18, excuse me, 1996, I served as the quartermaster for the Applegate wagon train. What the quartermaster does is lays out the route, figures out where the water is coming from, gets permission from the landowners, makes sure there's insurance, all those things they didn't do in 1846, you know. They just had to worry about where the food was coming from. They worried about Indians. They worried about things like that. But they didn't have to worry about the other. Mm -hmm. Worried about people being upset because we slowed their cars down if they happened to come on a road that we would happen to be on. But the wagon train stayed as close as possible to the 1846 Applegate Trail, knowing that when you have a trail that starts out by squirrels and then deers run on the same trail and then Indians run on the same trail and then fur trappers and each time another group gets on that trail it gets wider and it becomes more of a road. Now all of our roads cover the trail. So like I-5 and um, 99, a lot of times they're going right over the Applegate Trail. So if you would have seen the reenactment, you would have seen our wagons sometimes going on pavement we tried to stay off as much as possible, but that's where we had to cross on the trail. So that was pretty, pretty incentivizing to go out ahead of time and make sure I knew exactly where those wagons were going to be, have permission from the landowner to spend the night or whatever. Lots of communities came out together and they threw parties for us and they had fiddle get-togethers and you know, potlucks and they're in the granges and it was it was incredible. It was an incredible trip. How many wagons total were in the train? It varied from seven to about fourteen wagons, thirteen, fourteen wagons. So that's another thing. People signed up to go on the wagon train. They signed up in uh, nineteen ninety three and they signed up in nineteen ninety six. The difference being in nineteen ninety three for the Oregon Trail they had the sponsorship and the protection of Pretty much the whole United States was after him to celebrate the sesquicentennial of the Oregon Trail. In, in 1996, we did not have that. We had local sponsorship. Um, the ones that were in, in 1993 had motorhomes following them. They got showers. They were promised three meals a day, you know, all those kinds of things. In 1996, I promised them a good time. <laughs> that was it. So they signed a waiver and said, you know, if you get hurt, if you can't make it, you know, I don't know when you're going to get your shower. I don't know when you're going to get three meals a day. You may get two meals a day. Mm -hmm. And usually that meant somebody would hand you an apple and a peanut butter sandwich or something. We'd try to eat, you know, whatever was available. Did you and say five days before? Did yes. It been five days without a shower? Toward the end when we got up to... Uh, Polk County Fairgrounds at the end of the trail. It had been five days since I'd bathed. Mm -hmm. And um, my best friend from years before had met me there. I didn't know she was going to be there. And she, she said she smelled me from <laughs> <laughs> 10 feet away. I told so, Linda, her. Linda, did you also have a car, I mean, to go out and, and, and pre get ready for 
letting the, the farmers know and the thing that you were coming? Did no, you? but there were lots of people following us, okay. and we had lots of we had lots of press going on. The BBC was behind mm -hmm. us, and mm -hmm. there was press everywhere. Even the Hawaiian papers were covering. I don't know what that had to do with Hawaii, but they covered us on the front page of the Hawaii Honolulu Press or something. Um, we had posses, horse posses from each county mm -hmm. that met us at the county line and they saw that we were safe and they, you know, they rode their horses ahead and blocked off traffic and kept, uh, kept us moving mm -hmm. um, so that we didn't have people come up on the tail end of us. I did have my horse get hit at one point, but it was just brushed and uh, I said, let her go because she didn't even know she hit the horse and she wasn't a good driver. <laughs> She was like out of it. So in 1996, again with the sesquicentennial, um, people had to sign up if they wanted to go on the trip with us. They had to sign up if they wanted to become an outrider. An outrider was a horseback rider that would kind of protect the other horses and people and let them know what's going on. And if a horse got away or a team got away, then they were supposed to go after them, which we had somebody go after them and we had somebody get hurt in 1993, um, as we crossed the Black Rock. There was um, such a feeling with the reenactment that it's hard for me almost 30 years later to bring up now, but it was the smell of the horses. It was not, not just the smell of us, but the smell of the horses. You know, people talking and soft. Um, voices, not screaming at each other, getting up early in the morning and having breakfast and taking care of our animals, um, getting to be good friends with the people that you travel with, learning to expect each other to take care of the other one, have each other's back. It was incredible. And um, when it was over with, there was a real loss for a bunch of us. We met within six months after the wagon train and it was like our whole life had changed again. So it was pretty, pretty incredible. Um, the Applegate Trail was also known as the Southern Oregon Route to the Oregon Trail. And the reason it was known that way is a lot of people were very upset with the Applegate brothers because they didn't feel that the Applegate brothers were truthful to them when they told them that it would be a less perilous route. So they decided that it was gonna be the Southern Route. And they never spoke to the Applegate brothers again. So covered wagons, I told you the measurements of a covered wagon. There were also different kinds of wagons, and we had a lot of different ones on our trip. There's, you know, you've seen the Western movies with the doc doctor's buggy with the fringe hanging down, you know, that's just a little wagon. That's not one that they would have taken on a wagon train. Um, there were Conestogas, which were usually the bigger wagons, usually 12 feet long. Um, buckboards, that's like the farm workhorse. You know, the buckboard is what you threw a bale of hay in if you wanted to take it out to your cow, or if you were going to town to pick up supplies, you would take your buckboard to town. There were buckboards with us, and they were a great thing to have along. The covered wagon, which took me three years to build, um, while we were hiring people on, and we were getting people's horses together and stuff, uh, the covered wagon, I don't know if you've heard, but you know, they're usually green frame, and that's because they're John Deere's. John Deere is actually the first maker of a covered wagon. And so those John Deere frames, if you get under at an auction and look at a frame on a wagon, if you saw John Deere, or you saw the little three-legged implement on there, you knew it was a John Deere. You got all excited. Mm -hmm. And mine was a John Deere. Mm -hmm. I was so excited. When we got ready to start figuring out who was going to be on the trail, who were going to be our main stays, who was going to be you know, our medical team, who was going to be our food, in charge of our food, who was going to be in charge of each thing on the team, uh, shoeing the horses and things like that. We had to check out their horses because on the original wagon train, they didn't have horses. Mm -hmm. They had oxen. Mm -hmm. And oxen, I don't know if you know, but that's a civilized steer is what it is. It's not a bull. Um, and, but they used oxen for lots of reasons. One of the reasons is oxen could pull more weight. Mm. Second reason is oxen would, could eat old grass. Horses needed fresh grass. Wow. And the Indians wouldn't steal them. The Indians didn't like the oxen. Mm. 
they could, couldn't see any use for them. The other thing is um, the oxen were very consistent with their pulling. They could pull a lot of weight and they could pull it for long periods of time. So the oxen were, and the oxen were cheaper than horses and the horses just weren't that prevalent around them. Um, so the oxen would also be trained to have a yoke around its neck and you've seen those heavy yokes. Those are made out of wood, those are heavy. God. So if you were hooking up to a team and the longer your wagon was, the bigger your wagon and the bigger load it had, the more oxen you needed to pull your team. So if we had horses, I don't think we call it this with an oxen, but with horses, if you have four horses on a wagon, we call that a four up hitch. And I don't think we call it that with the oxen. Um, on the weight on the, the food that was in the wagon, 2,000 pounds, I told you, so a, t a ton. That was just the least amount you could carry, and then they were constantly foraging for food along the way. Constantly, constantly looking for game, and vegetables, and onions, and camas roots, and whatever they could eat, shaking out pine cones for the nuts in the pine cones, and just, you know, acorns. They made their flour out of acorns when they ran out of flour. But they carried on their wagon, what they were supposed to come on with was coffee, flour, sugar, salt, bacon, pickles to fight scurvy, cornmeal, dried fruit, bread, beans, and hardtack. And if you don't know what hardtack is, it's like made out of flour and water. It's like a little chewy piece of bread. And that's what hardtack is. So I mentioned that families a lot of times would have up to 10 children sometimes. And that was more often the way it was because they came from farms back in, you know, back east. And um, a lot of the kids didn't have school. They weren't, they were somewhat educated, but not overly educated. So in my book, um, I talk about that and I address that. Also, you hear a lot about the Applegate Trail and other trails. You hear a lot of, well, you see a lot of movies that show Indians and cowboys fighting and Indians and settlers fighting. I'm Native American, and I don't really want to bring that up, except that in my book I featured how hard of a time they had, not that the Indians were there fighting, because that isn't what killed most of the people on the wagon trains. What killed most of them on the wagon train was what I'm going to read to you now. The grave we prayed over was not only the one we found. More unmarked graves dotted the top of the hill along with assorted pieces of furniture, a heavy skillet and extra clothing. It was as if these were taught who crossed before us were in reinforcing the importance of lightening our loads before rather than after crossing mountains. If you wanted not to be sure, if you wanted to be sure it was not the last mountain you climbed. Most of the belongings we found were not touched or loaded into our wagons regardless of the room. Near void clothing was laid on the ground with only bones sticking from the sleeves and the pants. Rocks were piled in an attempt to keep the body from being further desecrated. No remaining food was found. At this point of our journey, dreams keep us moving forward. Though riddled with sadness for those who didn't make it, it was clear that without our dreams we could not crawl up and over mountains, float and swim across rivers, camp in alkali flats, and of course eat a supper of dirt served up with coffee no longer strong. Dreams remain because of our new friends, all pioneers with guts who wanted a new and better life. We knew that up to this point of our travels, settlers died from accidents, snake bites, disease, and depending on your location, Indian attacks, of which we have had none to date. Hardships didn't always come in. Hardships didn't always come in big events. It was the daily grind of 10 hours a day behind a wagon that was blowing dirt in your face, pulling your skirts from the berry vines, finding a place to go to the bathroom in private while on the desert. It was having a toothache and no powders to help with the pain, or foot blisters and sore because there was no dentist to make you a new pair of shoes. It was every day of every month for five or six months that our break caused pioneers to lose their drive and sometimes their mind, it caused them, like oxen, to stop right where they stood or fell down, sometimes to shed some tears before going back up, 
other times lifted up by fellow travelers, each taking, each keeping each other strong, or at the very least, moving. Thank you. Linda, you mentioned that you used a diary, uh, several diaries, and where where did they get found, or where were they that you found? That That's you a great found? question. First of all, this this is not my journal, but it's like my journal. Mm -hmm. And that's why my book looks the way it does, because I wanted it to look like my journal. But I got a call, we put a call out throughout the state of Oregon um, for people who had diaries that had traveled, family had traveled through the Oregon or the Applegate Trail. And I got a call from this lovely little lady out of Salem, and she said, I want to donate my diary to you. And I said, well, I don't want you to donate your diary to me, but I'll sure take copies of it. So she gave me a copy of her diary. Then there was um, the Meacham Diaries. So there's diaries around. Um, it's like learning to read a different language when you read these because the spelling is so poor. Mm -hmm. But um, you get the drift, you get the feeling. And, and did you find it, did you get the diaries before you left on your trip or uh, after? Before. Before. So when I was researching and laying out the route, I was trying to find places that we could pull over and stop that would have some kind of significance. Okay. Um, one place that we went to that I particularly remember, and I hope I don't make anybody embarrassed, but we had Dennis, which was our um, mountain man, and he was real, and he's real in my book. Um, we had a couple of other people that did some great jobs on the trail. And he had told me when we came around the hill that there was a cemetery up above. And we were on paved, ro paved road at that point. We were crossing some paved road. And there was a fence along there, barbed wire fence. And he said, I think we're coming up to the cemetery. And that's from this diary at such and such date. And I said, well, why don't you run ahead and find out if there's a place for us to pull the wagons over. And if there is, we'll, we'll stop and pay our respects. Well, he came back and he said, there's no place to pull over. But he went under the wire. And he was a mountain man, and he dressed like a mountain man, which meant that he had buckskins on his top that he had, an animal that he had killed and tanned himself. He had leggings on and a breech cloud. He had no, nothing in the middle of the front of him or in the back of him. And the rest of us were used to that. But a couple of the ladies on the trip that had joined us for a couple of days on their horses, they were in total shock when he bent down to go under that fence. <laughs> and that really weeded them out quick. <laughs> but we also, when we got of Salem, we, were, we stayed next to a cemetery. And, um, you know, it's really interesting if you ever go into a cemetery and you just walk around and read headstones. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. And that really brought us all, kind of made us humble. My best place to visit was right outside of Roseburg. We were um, camping in, is it Myrtle Creek? Myrtle Creek or Myrtle Point? Myrtle Point, I get this too mixed up. Myrtle Point, we were staying in that town that night. And um, so three of the ladies went with me. This is the dress that I wore on the trip. It's really my dress. And. Um, so I had that dress on and I had my black hat on that's over there on the candlestick. And um, we decided to walk up the hill and just check things out. And it was really funny because you could hear, you could hear voices like from the past. And I wasn't the only one that felt it. There were other, in fact, we got pulled over by the police. We were sitting up on a rock, just, just sitting there, not bothering anybody. And a policeman pulled up and he said, is there something I can help you with? And I said, no, we're just paying our respects. And he said, what's going on? And I said, well, you probably noticed the wagon trains in town. And he said, yes. And I said, well, we're here just to say hello. You know, it was exactly where they took those wagons over that rock. And they were letting us know that they were there. They're still there. It was incredible. I would like to answer any questions that you might have. Or if there's something that you were interested in hearing about. Then we're on the, the original trip, um, when they came from Missouri, where did they cross the Rockies at? I don't know. Okay. And I, again, I, I apologize, but some things I've forgotten and some things I never knew. When I started learning about the Applegate Trail, I was totally involved in that, and I wasn't worried about the Oregon Trail anymore. That was gone. 
that was history. And I was trying to make a safe route for us. I felt like a little bit like the Applegate brothers. <laughs> and so the decision to start in Winnemucca, uh, that, what was that based on? Well, I'm not sure what it was based on, but the trip for us in 1996 was divided into two sections. Okay. So it was the east side from Winnemucca <clears throat> to um, Don, Don Roulette's place at Boxar okay. Ranch. And then at Box R, we had the West Side start. So we, we had a lot of people that went both sections. And then we had a lot of people that went on the East Side and only on the West Side, things like and that. And for you, Linda, did you start at the Box R? I went to Winnemucca and started the first day with them and got them off and got them okay. across the desert. And then I went back because I had a job to do. And I was still working on the trail. Yeah. So I had to be the connection. And then I got on at Box R when we finished and went the next 31 days to Polk County. And Polk County had a wonderful celebration for us. They had a um, land giveaway. When we got there, they had a big dinner for us and they gave us a piece of land and they gave us a grant to this little, little piece of land in Polk <laughs> County. But it was, um, the people that traveled the Applegate Trail were going to Eden. That's what they called it, Eden, the land of milk and honey. They thought they were going to see fish jumping out of the water, and you know, and they did. You know, it was much more plentiful than what they, where they came from, in a lot of ways. Um, but women, as you'll find out, had nothing to say about going on the trail. When the men came home with the stars in their eyes, they said, we're loading up tomorrow, we're headed out. You know, they're walking out of their house, they're walking away from their furniture. <clears throat> and that's what got a lot of people, killed a lot of people, because they were left behind, because their wagons were broken down, because they carried too much, they tried to carry furniture. There's no room. In my wagon, I had a trunk, and that trunk would go from side to side of my wagon, you couldn't sleep in the wagon because you carried everything in there. And if you were a mother, heaven forbid, with small children, you had to carry one on each hip and, you know, sometimes pregnant on top of that. That's how a lot of the children were killed. They were run over by wagon wheels because they were trying to stay close to the wagon and trying to keep up. And they couldn't keep up. The horses that were pulling our wagons were going about three miles an hour. And we had people walking, and by the end of the day, they knew they'd been walking. You know, they were beat. So oxen walked slower, but still you had territory that nobody had ever crossed before. So it was pretty rough cross. Would you typically travel in a day, and how far would you go? Well, we traveled um, between 12 and 20 miles a day, depending on the territory. Um, but I think it was probably something similar to that too back in the 1800s because they had a longer distance to go. They were going from the east all the way. So they were traveling for six months where we only traveled for three, less than three. You know, uh, living up there where the Tub Springs is and where there's a sign, you know, honoring, first of all, the women look very unhappy, look very unhappy <laughs> in the sign. like. They were not happy campers getting to Tub Springs. And, you know, it's so, there's so much volcanic rock in, the, in that terrain. Oh, yeah. I just wondered, gosh, when did, mm -hmm. when did that start? You know, I mean, like, where, where's the points towards Klamath Falls? I mean, or is, is the Klamath Falls also on the Applegate Trail? I'm sort of fascinated by what was there, There's a line there, and I'd have to look it up again, yeah. but there's a line there by, I think, by Tule Lake. Oh, by Tule Lake. I think okay. it's around by Tule Lake. Okay. But again, um, my memory is yeah. really well, gotten Well, that, that would be interesting. I mean, coming from Winnemucca and towards Tule Lake, I, it's mm. just, uh, does that make sense, Matt? Seems like it. Yeah, right on yeah. Track. Yeah. Anyway, but it just seemed like, wow, <laughs> you know, it was supposed to be the better route. And I could see how the Applegate brothers might get vilified for not having found a better route. At well, all. and they didn't know. They, they hadn't know. looked. No. And they hadn't looked. They got their family settled, and then they sent somebody else back. Levi yeah. Scott went back with them. Yeah. So, yes, they're going to be vilified. Yeah. What time of the year did you do your trip? We did our trip. We started on Memorial Day weekend in Winnemucca. It was 102 degrees. 
and we finished in Polk County in, I'm pretty sure it was September. It might have been the first week of October. And it was 32 degrees and sleet rain. The night before we had slept in just pouring rain, we were all on the horse trailers and anything we could find that anybody was camping around us, we were, we were diving for it. So bathing in bathrooms, mm. subjects people don't like to address, but if you're gonna go out for 31, 51 days on the trail, you better be thinking about it. These dresses were made large for a reason. Yeah. A lot of the women would gather around in a circle and hold their skirts out so that one could be in the middle and do her bathroom business. There were some places they didn't do that because there weren't enough women around wearing large skirts. But everybody else kept their eyes straight ahead, keep moving straight ahead. Um, and you lost some of your shyness. Not all of it, but some of it. Um, to bathe, it was whenever there was a creek or a river you could find. And with us in 1996, there were so many people along the way that wanted to share with us. And so they said, we're, we're opening up our bathrooms to you for the night. You know, just come through and take showers and do, I don't know if it was for their protection or ours, but um, there was a, several times when we did that, that was really, really sweet. And then there was a motel over by Rice Hill that did the same thing. We were in Yonkala, and um, Yonkala threw a wonderful ceremony for us, and it was great. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So where did you sleep? And well, I had a bedroll, and uh, when my wagon got less full, I slept in the wagon in my bedroll. But most of the time, I had what's called a cowboy teepee. And in my album over there, if you take a time to look at it, there's a picture of another cowboy teepee. And it's made from canvas, and it's sharp at a point called like a teepee, but it's got four sides on it. Mm -hmm. So, and it's got, you know, and I had it made in Montana special. We asked people to wear period costumes, period clothing, I should say. They weren't costumes to us. Yeah. Um, and no plastic, no sunglasses, unless they were, you know, these old, old sunglasses. And they didn't make sunglasses then. Um, the hats, the bonnet that she has on here beside me was used when they were out on the prairie most of the time because the back has a long back to it that keeps her neck covered and the top would shade, shade her eyes, keep her from, because women just looked horrible after a year out in the desert or out, you know, outside all the time. Um, the black hat over there, the big black hat, was my everyday hat. I wore that on the wagon. I wore it when I was tending the horses. I wore it all the time. Um, the bonnet was when I wanted to look extra pretty. And I had another dress that I'd put on when we went to town. And um, I was telling someone earlier about a gentleman coming up to me and handing me a rose when I was traveling through on the wagon and I had my bonnet on and he came up and he was just like mushy, you know. <laughs> oh, ma'am, you look so pretty. Like, <laughs> Hands me a rose, I was like, okay. Even on the train. <laughs> Here, smell. <laughs> yeah. So then to say something about how you uh, eight, you know, like, I mean, as you're moving for these these days, was there somebody in charge of the quote-unquote chuck wagon, or how, how is it that That's you... a really good question, because we had a chuck wagon to start with uh, on the west side, but the horses got sick oh. in Ashland, actually. Oh. And so we ended up, um, we had some places that wanted us to stop that was on our schedule. We scheduled in school children and let them, you know, go through the, you know, small groups and things like that. Um, but we mostly ate beans and fried potatoes and a lot of the things that they ate back then. Lots of strong coffee, lots of strong drink. Um, I'm but trying to think. during that time, you couldn't necessarily start fires through the summer. No, we very, very seldom did we yeah. have a fire. Very yeah. seldom. So then what was the way that you heated things up? Well, you didn't always heat things up. <laughs> so they were cooked, and like at night we'd eat something, and then she would give us a biscuit and an apple for the next day. And that was either breakfast or lunch, because we needed to get on the road. Wow. And always the horses were taken care of first. We had our own blacksmith with us. We had our own med people here, uh, you know, that had some medical degrees. We had um, 
trying to think of some of the other specialties that we had. But in my book, I address that by having one of the girls teach school as they, as they move along so that the kids wouldn't be without education. Did you have kids? Did they get yes, kids? we did. That's a great question. Uh, that reminds me of a story. So we had a couple of children. Uh, one of them was a 12-year-old, Jesse. Oh, Jesse Randall? Yeah, I think so. Matol's, Matol's nephew. Oh, well, I was just thinking Don's... Uh, Don's great-grandson. No, this was, this was Matol's. Uh, anyway, Jesse got stepped on by and he had to ride some time in the wagon, but he went the whole 51 days. And then we had a girl who, she went the 31 days, and she got the okay from her teacher because she, she was doing summer school. And the teacher said, I can't think of a better way to learn about the Applegate Trail in history than to go on this trip. So... She is just a really cutie, and she comes riding up to me outside of Riddle, and I was on the head wagon, being the quartermaster, and uh, she's all excited because that McDonald's off the, to the left of I-5, down near Riddle. She says, there's a McDonald's up ahead. Can we please, please, please take the wagons through the Golden Arches? And I said... I don't know that we can do that. And of course, the wagon master was driving the wagon, and he goes, no, we're not going to do it. I said, just wait a minute. Let's think about this. <laughs> so I told the Al riders to go up and check out the Golden Arches to see if we could get through the drive through with our wagons without hurting anything, and if it was OK with McDonald's. So she comes back, whooping and a holler, and a big smile on her face, and said, they said we can cross and do the <laughs> through the drive through and so we get up there, and they had closed McDonald's. Oh, and they were standing out there with animal cookies. <laughs> orange juice. And it was just the cutest thing, and so she was so happy. But one of the other things that was cool about that is that one of our writers, Leslie, her brother came to visit from the Bay Area, and he was a producer, no, excuse me, Los Angeles. He was a producer for one of the daytime series that was playing. And... Um, he had brought his young man from the Big Brother program. And uh, this kid did not talk, he did not smile, he was just very frozen up. And so he's got his clothes on that he's looking the part, but he's not smiling. Well, when he came back, when she came back and said we could go through the drive up, he started to smile. You could see his mouth turning up, but he wasn't saying anything. We went through the Golden Arches, and then the next afternoon we stopped at some place. They had an ice cream social for us, and we were eating ice cream. And he was just so animated, and he was laughing and telling this story. Fast forward, he comes back to Grants Pass to see Leslie after his graduation from high school. And he tells me that was the one thing I remember in my life coming here. He said, is, that was the funnest day of my life, just going through that Golden Arches and being in pioneer clothing. He thought that was hilarious. So the other thing was that uh, I mentioned that I'm Native American, and Grandma Aggie was a very dear friend of mine. She performed my wedding ceremony and my funeral ceremony for my late husband. And she and I were very tight, and we draw, uh, danced a lot together at powwows and things. We met up with her at Valley of the Rogue State Park and several of the other natives. And they did a real great ceremony saying, you know, that this is kind of crossed the line now. We need to forgive each other, the settlers for coming in and taking over their land and the Indians for, you know, warring on them and all of these things that were going on back then. We need to be um, a little bit more understanding. So it was great. It was great to be with Grandma Aggie for that. Yeah. And uh, when I would wear my regalia on the wagon train, which was just very, very few times, but the children would really be excited, you know, to come and talk to the pioneers and then talk to the Indian. <laughs> <laughs> was it just one of you? Just, just, one, uh, of just you? one of me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was so fascinating for me, that perspective. And uh, I have settlers that came on that same wagon train and, and came for gold and settled Jacksonville and Goldville and Penn Pass. And then I have other family that came and settled right at the foot of the Table Rocks. Yes. They farmed for six generations, and they were in total conflict, you know? Yes. And so the perspective of the First Nation people on this, of what brought 
you know, that energy yeah. of the like colored skin, you know. So it's mm. so fascinating for me to this perspective. I'm so grateful. I came from Merlin because I was like, oh, I'm supposed to be there for that. Oh, <laughs> cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming. And, you know, they're on that Rogue River, but Grandma Abby's very, you know, potent in that. And so anyway, I just. Yeah, it's a very profound perspective, honestly, you yeah. know, for you. To you and I have met before. Yeah, we have. Yeah, we had a deep connection when we met. And yeah, my yeah. name is Joy Love. I'm yes. grateful to see you again. Good to see you again, too. <laughs> Good to see you. But I'm also, I'm very fascinated because I wonder if uh, all of your documentation went into the book about, like, how to organize a caravan. I'm very fascinated no. about how organized the trains No, but I can, I can tell you a little bit about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I can tell you about it, but I, I didn't put that all in the book. Mm -hmm. And my books are for sale, by the way, today. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, I, I, unfortunately, I need to leave pretty soon, but I wanted to share, uh, I, as I said, I live up to Green Springs, not so far away from Tub Springs and what have you. And um, as I lived there for 16 years, you know, one of the things that became apparent to me was that I didn't even think of the, native, the, the indigenous people be, you know who was there when I right. got there, and uh, and what showed up and my meeting Grandma Aggie and the indigenous grandmothers was that um, I needed and actually and having a friend who saw whole family uh, or generations coming on the land uh, and sort of walking by little children, older children, you know had had this vision right. and that they were there. And so then I started to do work with Grandma Aggie about, about healing that land and, and, and just bringing intention to um, the, this acreage. Just about a, a year, maybe less than a year ago, um, I had a friend who's a Yucatan Indian, uh, Mexican Yucatan, as from, and has a, still a place back there at home, up there doing some work. Uh, just sort of uh, working the, the, the land and not working, raking. Right. And he heard these hooves, these, you know, this thundering hooves uh, coming towards him. I mean, he could, he was bending over his rake and he could hear it to the point where he sort of reared back and up came this warrior. And he said he, his color of his skin was just absolutely exquisite, this kind of golden brown um, skin. And his hair, he said it was like he had just come from the beauty parlor, you know, in terms of this black straight hair with white tips on the end. And this fierceness to him, he could see in his eyes, but he could also see the, the other side of that fierceness. And telepathically, that warrior said, we, we know that you know we're still here. And uh, and that was that was the message. And, and Victor wanted to kind of further ask ask more, but then he was gone. Mm -hmm. So you know the whole idea of uh, they're still here, yep. you know, and that you're <laughs> you're still here, but they're still here all over. The um, the book does mention in it that uh, the Kalapuya, which are the Kalapuya Indians from up in the Eden area, which is around Eugene, Willamette Valley. You'll see uh, signs as you go up the freeway, uh, the California Creek, and or I think it's the waterway. And that's also, when you're reading the book, I think you'll find that that's where they start eating the camas roots, because camas is a big thing um, up in the up in, um, Roseburg area, mm -hmm. and near the casino as well, and that's what they ate. But they made them sick if they weren't careful with them. So, Part of, the, um, part of the cool thing about being on the wagon train is that we have a couple people that I met that were on the wagon train that were really, truly mountain men, that were really, truly, um, they knew the plants, they knew where to find them, they knew how to make a pair of moccasins, they knew how to brain tan a hide and, you know, make it fit and make it wear. What type of tanning? Brain, like brain tanning. So the animal that they kill, they would use the brains and smash them up and rub them on the hide. To tan it? Yeah. The animal has exactly the right amount of brain to tan its own hide. Well, oh, that is so yeah. weird. Yeah. yeah. I've never heard that before. Yeah. yeah. I just heard and I have my uh, regalia, which I can't wear right now because I can't get it off. <laughs> I can't get it off. <laughs> can't get it off with this little 
thing I got going on here. Um, so there was a, I was never that interested in history before. Never that interested. And when I got interested in it, I don't know how to do anything halfway. And so I got really involved. And then the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn. And I'd find myself in conversations with people. They'd start talking about something, and then I would just get right in the middle of it. Um, it was because I had felt that I had lived it. Even though it was 150 years later, I felt that I had lived the Applegate Trail. And it was, yeah, an incredible experience. Um, Don Roulette was a, a very kind man and very, very <coughs> smart. Um, and he was very well loved and very well thought of throughout the county, throughout the state. Um, there's a lot of Applegate Trail markers as you go up and down the highway. You'll find them all the way up through Sunny Valley and Calipuya area and you know up through Roseburg. And they have some really nice um, places you can stop and read information along the way. So I suggest you do that if you haven't done it already. Was there a reason that it ended at Independence, or was that, I mean, was there anything? That was the southern route. Yeah. You know, and they were just doing the southern route because they had already settled the Oregon part of the territory. Okay. So. Linda, in your book, the um, main female character, where do they? Quaista. Where, where, you know, where do they stop? Where, where do they, where does the book where she ends in? If you look at the book, the cover, I think I told you that. It's as close as I could find to, to Eugene area, to Willamette, Willamette Valley. And um, I started the second book, but um, I don't feel like it's going to be quite the same because I'm not living the Applegate Trail life now. I was living the Applegate Trail when I was on it. So I made it very easy to write. You're welcome. Fabulous. It's good, good to see I you. I have to go get my grandson. Okay. So, I love it. Mm -hmm. Thank Bye. You, Linda. That was yeah. so pretty. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Did you want a snack and book? Huh? Did you want a snack and book? No. So, no. any other questions? You got something on the tip of your tongue. Gosh, I just, I have so much. I, I don't even have my hand. Um, I'm just very fascinated about like the choice of the horses and if you investigated mules or donkeys or if you had pack animals that Oh, would... you know, that's really, you reminded me, um, how did we get those horses? So I went to a heavy horse meeting uh, in Talent and announced to the group in Talent that we were looking for people with horses that would pull wagons, people who wanted to be involved in the trip. And that's how I got my horses. Jack and Prince were their names. Mm. And they were Belgians. Beautiful, beautiful horses. The pictures are in the album over there. And um, a dear old man came up to me. His name was Gerald Gleason. I'm sure he wouldn't mind that I say his name out loud. Mm -hmm. He said, I have two horses, Jack and Prince. I want them to be a part of making history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, I can't drive them myself. He said, they're spoiled rotten. But he said, I want them to be a part of this. So at that point, we started working with those two horses. Three years it took us. Wow. And so they pulled my wagon. And they not only pulled it then, but they pulled it in 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. Because wow. we did shorter trips after that. You know, we do like a weekend thing. Once you start doing that, it's hard to quit. <laughs> and. Um, we had a pair of mules, my friend Liz, who has since passed away. She was a great mule skinner. Yeah, okay. Yep. I bet you know my grandparents, Joyce and Ed Robinson, because they literally did the wagon trains. They had the, I mean, they were raising mules. I the probably met them. Ridge. Yeah. And yeah, John and Liz were very dear friends of theirs. Yes. So, yeah, we had mules, we had buckboards, we had a doctor's buggy on the east side. They met up with us at the end of the trail, too. And a lot of them, you know, they couldn't take that much time off work either. You know, they had to work and raise a family. So. What happened to your wagon after? It is with the city of Grants Pass, and I think they have it stationed out at Pottsville. Yeah. It's either at Pottsville or it's in Sunny Valley. And I wrote the grant for the Sunny Valley Museum, so it could be out there too, but yeah. Well, I think that kind of wraps it up. Where do you live? 
In Grass Pass? I did for 20 years, and now I've been here in, in Medford, Central Point area for 20 years. Uh -huh. But when I left in 1998, I left Grants Pass, <clears throat> and I moved to Arizona, and I put a wagon train together for them in Arizona for the 100th celebration, 100th year. Ah, uh, great. Yeah, and I had to leave before they had it, so. But it was Tombstone, Arizona, so. <laughs> Still that Western experience. Uh, so do you feel a sense of completion with this project? Are you moving on to something else, or is there something... I mean, I felt like I'm, what you spoke about the healing of the relations, so that's still very pertinent. You know? Yes. Well, right now, I don't know, you weren't here when I said that I have Parkinson's. I've just been diagnosed. So um, I'm actually thinking about writing a book about living with Parkinson's. Beautiful. Because I, I think I need to write about things that I'm involved in and that I feel and that make total sense to me. I don't think I'd be good at writing a fiction just to be writing a fiction. And if I wrote the second book, even though people are asking me, what happened to so-and-so, what happened? <laughs> well, okay. So, I love writing. And I'm not doing anything else right now, so I should be, should yeah. be writing.